And as we move on, our watchwords for this presentation tonight are history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, a saying given to us by that well-known aphorist Anon. Well, what precisely do we mean by that? We're going to be looking at two battles tonight, as we've already said, and there's a few common themes. They're both the first battles of their respective wars, major battles for their respective wars for the British. One, they both take place in the South Atlantic off of South America. That's very important. We'll get to that later. They both feature German uh, forces snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, if you like. Um, we'll get to that later as well. Uh, Admiral Graf Spey, present at both battles, despite the fact they take place 25 years odd apart. And they both um, meant early an early end to an early success for German commerce raiders. And of course, they were both turned into major motion pictures that were very popular for the immediate post-war audiences. So let's start off. Why exactly is Britain fighting in the South Atlantic in support of, a Euro of European wars anyway? Um, and this really goes back to the Corn Laws, well before the beginning of the, the Great War, or indeed even the Second World War. Um, the repeal of the Corn Laws, circa 1840s, 1850s, essentially removed the tariffs on imported food. And this at the time was Britain weaponising free trade. Um, and as Sir Jim Goldsmith observed, the agricultural depression of late Victorian England was not really an unfortunate side effect of the Industrial Revolution, but rather an, an instrument of it. We've got to remember at the time Parliament was representing the interests of businessmen and, and mill owners and by encouraging the import of plentiful cheap food this essentially undermined the British um, rural economy so you had through the 19th century and at the end of the 18th as well very large numbers of people who for all of history before that point had been countryside dwellers um, finding themselves completely unable to compete with foreign imported food food coming from lamb from New Zealand, beef from Argentina, grain from the New World, etc. Um, so they were moving in very great numbers into the cities. Um, this um, did two things. It created a ready, uh, ready base of dislocated people uh, to become new consumers to buy manufactured goods. But more importantly, it created a, a ready supply of industrial labour, unemployed people heading to the cities for those, those mill jobs. And the invention of refrigeration and particularly refrigerated ships in the sort of late 19th century really exacerbated this pro process. As I was saying earlier, for the first time, uh, British people, when they sat down to the table, were eating New Zealand lamb, Argentinian beef. And the really extraordinary thing about this, and I think if we look at this in the context of um, coronavirus Britain today, and of course that's why I'm speaking to you from rural East Devon rather than a smelly pub in central London, um, Compare it to how it is today. In 1914, Britain imported about 60% of its food. Now in 2020, the figures roughly approximately, although it's slightly contested for reasons we can go into afterwards in the Zoom, um, is about 40%. So even in this age of globalisation, food miles, the European Union, the lot, we actually imported more food 110 years ago than we do now. And that was because of that process of... Um, industrialization during the Victorian era, food being brought in from abroad and not being grown here. So the important, the important thing here is that Germany knew this, of course they did. So their major offensive strategy against the British um, was a, essentially a blockade of Britain with commerce raiders. Um, yeah, every child still knows about the convoy system and um, yeah, they generally think about this in terms of great groups of ships in the Atlantic and the, the North Atlantic going to Arkhangelsk and Russia and stuff and U-boats and all that but really this started in the Great War with the commerce raiders which were surface ships and that is why in the early part of both wars, the Great War and the Second World War, um, the the early action was taking place in the South Atlantic, not the North, which is obviously where, where Europe is. So what did this look like? Let's have a look here. So what we've got here is a map showing what they uh, called Maximilian von Spee's cruise. Now, let's just move, so we'll come back to this in a minute. Let's move on again. So what we have here is um, the... SMS Scharnhorst, um, which was von Spee's ship, and in the top left-hand corner we have a very uh, romanticised cigarette card of um, Maximilian Graf von Spee. And note on this, 
We've got a ship uh, transiting the canal. Um, throughout this talk, you're going to see loads of pictures of ships, and a lot of them are taken underneath this one bridge. This is the Levon High Bridge, uh, which is on the Kiel Canal. For reasons I don't fully comprehend, the Germans were really proud of this, the Kiel Canal and this bridge. So all of the sort of official pictures of their battleships they took, it was right here underneath this one bridge. Anyway, von Spey, and we'll go back to the map, von Spey uh, had been working out of uh, Germany's naval base in China, in Xingtao, um, which is the place the beer is named off, our, by the way, since 1912. Um, and at the outbreak of war, Germany actually had several positions, possessions rather, in the Pacific, uh, including the Pagan Islands, uh, which are now known as the US Mariana Islands, best known for their proximity to the Mar Mariana Trench. And if we look in the top left hand corner of the map here, we can see Xing Tao, if the resolution is good enough for you, and that's on the east coast of China, between China and Japan. And von Spey's plan was to take his squadron of ships um, back, basically back home to Germany, transiting the Pacific, round the Cape Horn, and somehow managing to break through um, the British blockade of mainland Europe and make it back home to Kiel, back to that bridge we saw a minute again. He thought he was going to manage this somehow. But uh, von Spey had a lot of damage to do on the way, and part of that was commerce raiding. So let's enter the Emden. So we've got a, a tighter picture of the map here, and we can see uh, the green arrow, which is separate from the purple, which is the thrust of the main fleet um, heading through to you know Cape Horn and, and onwards. But the green is the SMS Emden. So it was the fastest ship in his squadron, and although it wasn't a first rate, it wasn't one of his heavy cruisers, it was a light cruiser, it could clearly cause trouble with its four-inch guns, uh, especially for merchant shipping and the like. Um, so... Uh, he detached this ship um, as a um, an independent commerce raider, which would go round the Indian Ocean, the um, the Pacific, causing merry hell, basically. Um, and the idea was that this ship would catch up with the rest of the squadron later and go home with them. Uh, let's just move forward. So here we go. The Pluck Plucky Emden. You can see top left um, just how small she is. Um, top right, um, one of her four-inch guns. Um, bottom left, we'll get to that. So the adventures of the Emden are truly um, the stuff of boys' own novels. And honestly, some of the escapades here are truly worthy of being turned into films in their own right. I could have done a whole talk, and well, maybe I should have, um, just on this ship. Um, but I'll try to be brief. So let's st start with them raiding in the Indio Indian Ocean west of Singapore. Um, so to escape early detection, uh, the Emden rigged up a fake funnel um, so it could impersonate a British cruiser. And this becomes very important later. But I think that kind of shows early on the sort of the daring do and the almost cheeky nature of what the Emden was up to. Um, so in early September, um, she captured and sank half a dozen merchant vessels between Inder and Ceylon. Um, and there's a very important piece of the tactics um, that uh, the captain's using here. He's not just turning up saying, you know, we're at war, too bad, have some four-inch shell. He's boarding these ships, he's inspecting the documents, and he's, most importantly, paying attention to what the cargo is. So his crew are eating food that he's capturing off of British ships. His, his ship is being powered by coal he is pinching from these merchantmen. Um, so all the while, because... As the war progresses in these early days, all these German possessions in the Pacific are basically vanishing. The British are like, we'll have that, we'll have that, we'll have that. So he's pinching coal off of other ships to extend his own range. Um, but this kind of cuts both ways. Neutral ships that he's boarding during this time and are found not to be carrying war material for the Allies are simply released. Um, most ships at this point, unless they were military, didn't have... Um, radios even so he was pretty safe in doing this um, and for the ships that he did capture and I'm, as I say again he wasn't sinking these ships he was capturing them so if he wanted a very good supply of coal he came across a, a, a coal merchantman he would put his own officers on board and it would basically become his fleet tanker and he would agree to meet it at certain points but when he did that the original crew of that ship he would the captain actually paid their wages and if we're thinking that this is only 106 years ago or whatever, my God, how much war has changed. Um, 
so moving on, having uh, having captured uh, Sankal captured six ships. Um, he bombed bombarded Madras, Madras in late September. Um, you know, a, a, a really remarkable episode. This entering the harbour late at night, um, completely in, undetected. Of course, this is this is India. They're not expecting a German cruiser to turn up in the harbour at midnight. Um, he uh, turns on the ship's searchlights and uh, lights up the uh, the the bunkers that contain uh, oil for the um, the Burma Oil Company. And you can see that on the bottom left hand uh, corner there. And uh, he opens up this four-inch guns and sets them on fire, destroying 350,000 gallons of fuel oil. Um, in his diary, the captain said he did this to, and I shall quote, to arouse interest among the Indian population, to disturb English commerce, and to diminish English prestige. The idea here was essentially to give the British the shits, in essence, to show that no matter where in the world they were, uh, they were vulnerable to German attack, but also to destroy Indian confidence in the British Empire, because if they couldn't be defended by the British against a german light cruiser, um, you know, really what was the advantage they were getting from the Empire? So this was as much a propaganda thing as anything else for the Germans. Um, he then spent... <laughs> right, this is pretty extraordinary. Um, so having completed this action, um, he needed uh, 10 days to rest his crew and repair his engines. Obviously, this is a, a coal-fired ship um, with the boilers being lit basically constantly. Uh, they do um, fuzz up, if I can use that word, and this has become very important later. So he needs 10 days to, to clean his engines, to rest his crew, to do any minor repairs or whatever. So the um, the Emden turns up at uh, Diego Garcia, which is a pretty famous island these days because it was um, used as the Americans by an air base, but it's in the British Indian Ocean Territory. And back then it was a, a British possession. But the British inhabitants of the island, again, did not have a radio or a telegram. So a, uh, a German ship turns up, flags flying, and the British there welcome their friends because, of course, until... Uh, 1914 the Germans the British pretty much were um, they were delighted to find to have some European guests to their little far-flung far corner of empire and they actually helped them <laughs> the British actually helped the uh, the German crew of the end and affect their repairs and then wave them off as they left um, remarkable in the following weeks another six merchant ships captured or sunk um, again using them for supplies um, at this point in Europe, uh, the Battle of e first Battle of Eeps is kicking off to give you a sort of context of where we are. So, where does this leave us? By the end of October, um, the Emden um, was again getting up to uh, to scrapes. Top right hand corner there, a pretty fanciful postcard idea of the Battle of Penang, uh, which we'll go into now. So, once again, affecting her disguise as a British light cruiser with that extra funnel that they're made of canvas and wood um, the Emden was able to slip through the Straits of Malacca and into the harbour there and uh, yeah, absolutely unrecognised and once inside uh, the Emden yeah, raced to the, raised the Imperial Ensign and torpedoed a Russian cruiser uh, which was you know sitting alongside they thought their allies had turned up so that's the um, I've got it written down here the Zemshuk um, top left there the Russian um, light cruiser Ironically enough, the Zemshuk was um, part of the uh, forces that were actually hunting down um, von Spey, and they just had no idea the Germans were so close. Um, so she was alongside for repairs, her engines weren't lit, her boilers weren't lit, and her crew was on shore leave. So, embarrassingly enough for the officer involved, as the ship was sinking at its mooring... Um, the captain was on board, uh, sorry, the captain was on shore in his hotel, um, helplessly watching as his ship went down. Um, he was subsequently court-martialed, as you would expect, stripped of all his rank, and uh, sent by the Russian Empire to fight on the Eastern Front against the Germans. Um, where is subsequently decorated for bravery, but still quite a punishment. Um, she was also present at the Battle of Tsushima um, between Russia and Japan, and was one of the only survivors alongside the Aurora, the more famous cruiser, to have escaped. Anyway, the Emden fled um, Penang Harbour at this point um, and met on her way out a French destroyer, bottom left. Um, again, completely unexpecting uh, a French, uh, sorry, a German warship to turn up, um, had no idea what was going on and was also sunk by the Emden. Um, so by this point, this is a major problem for the British. Obviously, anything anywhere was now vulnerable to German um, commerce raiders, uh, but Evidently, this could not last. Um, the Emden, while attacking a, a British coaling station, um, 
to this point they've been used to things not having radios but the people ashore did have a radio this time uh, they managed to get off a, uh, a message just in time and it just so happened the HMAS Sydney Australian cruiser Sydney was nearby responded to the call and uh, went maxi chat to uh, deal it out so um, here we have the end of the Emden um, there was a duel of two light cruisers but the Sid Sydney was more heavily armed it had bigger guns eight six inches in fact um, and the two ships exchanged fire they both attempted to torpedo each other um, but within um, 40 minutes um, the Emden was <laughs> had basically been cut to ribbons half the crew were dead or injured um, as you can see it had four funnels it's down to one by this point um, so the captain ordered her to be beached on one of the nearby islands the idea being he could surrender uh, and the rest of the crew would live um, so that was it or was it there was one extra little story about the Emden which goes back to this idea of a boy's own adventure which is just crazy so what the British didn't know while they were cutting the Emden to ribbons was that the ship had already landed its boarding party on the island and there were 46 men including two officers and six um, NCOs I think uh, who were busy sabotaging the coaling station there including its radio um, so they were ashore um, and you can see top left there in their whalers uh, boats in their tropical funny tropical uniforms on the island and they were they were ashore watching their home the only link they had to home in the world uh, getting seven shades of something knocked out of it by the British um, so in another it should be turned into a film episode uh, this shore party underneath um, Lieutenant uh, Helmut von Muck who you can see on the right hand side here looking um, looking very German I suppose you could say uh, decided rather than waiting to be picked up by the British they would make good their escape and you can see on the left hand side there on the top um, there's a three rear a three masted schooner um, behind the Germans in their little boats and then below you've got a better photo of it photo of it this is the Aisha and this was the supply ship for the island um, they basically got rid of it when they bought a, a steamer um, but it was still there in the harbour it was rotten as hell all of its seafaring equipment had already been taken out it was basically a wreck um, but the uh, the party took their boats they rode out to it and they said this is our best hope so the made it seaworthy in record time and somehow managed to escape the island without being noticed by the British. Um, then over six months and I think 11,000 miles picked their way across the Pacific, through Asia, through Turkey and finally back to Europe, um, making it back to Germany before the end of the Great War, um, which is one of the longest um, like wartime escapes, if not the longest in human history. So yeah, there's definitely a film to be made there. Quite extraordinary. Funnily enough, von Muck um, joined the Nazi party in the 30s, in 20s or 30s. He was one of the very early people to join it, um, but actually spent most of the Second World War in a concentration camp because despite having joined the Nazi party, he actually really hated Adolf Hitler and thought he was a bad leader for Germany. Um, he survived the war uh, because the commandant of his concentration camp thought it was wrong that he'd been imprisoned because he was a, a, a legitimate hero of the Great War, so treated him well. Um, and after the war in the 50s, uh, von Muck uh, toured uh, Europe and America, giving anti-war speeches so there you go what a way to um to end your days so all of this um was happening in the eyes of the world and and i've called it the jolly japes of the emden um and at the time um the ship was known as the the plucky emden if you picked up a newspaper and read about these battles it'd be referred to the plucky emden and this was down to the sort of the, the gentlemanly approach of her captain to mer merchant vessels and crews and the sort of intrepid foot nature of her her battles outrunning the british kind of fox-like um but the plucky emden wasn't the brit wasn't the german nickname for the emden it was actually the british nickname and if you're reading about her in the UK, Hong Kong or Australia um, where it was big that's what they were calling her and actually when she was destroyed um, people kind of regretted it even in the UK and I think this is kind of a reflection of you know at this point in early 1914 everybody still believing the war will be over by Christmas it's a jolly jape it's a gentleman's war and people hadn't quite um, had the the scales fall from their eyes in this respect and that's why we have this slide um, which is the bombardment of um, of, of Scarborough and 
um, yes, indeed, the Germans bombarded the town, the, the Kriegsmarine bombarded the town, killed 40, uh, 18 people, including a 14-month-old boy. And you can see the level of damage um, that Scarborough took from you know, ger- heavy German um, naval gunfire. Um, and this marked a sudden change in the British attitudes uh, towards the war as a whole, but the, you know, the Germans specifically. They went from being fellow you know, civilised Europeans, gentlemen, Prussian stiffnecks with remarkable moustaches, all that, uh, to becoming baby killers. And this is where you start seeing all this um, you know, British propaganda posters, you know, babies on bayonets, you know, Germans smashing skulls and all that sort of thing. And uh, obviously, as we know, the war basically went downhill from there. So that's what the emblem was getting up to. Um, So let's think about getting towards what we're actually supposed to be talking about, given we've been speaking for 20 minutes already, which is the Battle of the Falkland Islands. So while the Emden has been having all of this fun, bunny ears, you know, kicking around the Indian Ocean, causing merry hell, Von Spee's been up to his own stuff in the um, the Scharnhorst. And I'm going to completely gloss over this for absolutely no reason whatsoever, including the fact that the Battle of Coronel was the first defeat for the Royal Navy in a hundred years and was clearly very embarrassing. Uh, Say no more on that. Um, But he's heading home. Um, Von Spey is um, heading, and there indeed, there we go, there's a a very fanciful um, painting of the Battle of Coronel where Von Spey's um, squadron sank (laughs) the entire British squadron under Kit Craddock. Um, And a lot of people died, unfortunately. Um, So he's trying to get back to the Falkland Islands. And if we look here, this is a, I'm just going to get... Oh, no, I can't. So that is a um, a photograph of Von Spey's squadron after the Battle of the Battle, Battle of Coronel. So we get an idea of the disposition, the sheer volume of ships, um, heavy cruisers and light cruisers, who are going to head round Cape Horn and then they think north um, through the Atlantic. So all he needs to do is cross nine thousand miles of the Atlantic and get past the Royal Navy's blockade to get home to Kiel. Simple, you might think, but. There is one last prize on the way that he hopes to get von Spey, and that is one more Royal Navy coaling station that he can destroy on the Falkland Islands. Now, there's some bad news for von Spey at this point, because the Royal Navy is out for his blood. Um, Von Spey, having destroyed the British um, squadron at Coronel, which was originally sent to stop him doing all the commerce raiding, he's heading home, and the British cannot let this lie. They have to have um, their, their own back. So... We have the British squadron assembled, two battle cruisers, Invincible and Inflexible, their sister ships, you know, best ships afloat, uh, heavy cruisers Kent, Cornwall, Carnarvon, light cruisers Glasgow and Bristol, and the Canopus as well, which is a old pre-dreadnought um, battleship. Huge guns, very slow, totally outclassed by anything that's fast and accurate, but huge guns, very important. So we have a situation where Von Spey is trying to get home. He's rounded the horn he's heading north um and he wants to burn the coal station on the way we have uh, doveton sturdy um who is the leader of the british squadron he's coming south from the united kingdom his plan is to head to the falkland islands to recoal and get ready to start searching for von spey so if we take the official account of history neither of them are actually expecting to find each other there um and when they do obviously there's a battle now this is not a battle um, that had to happen. In fact, it very nearly didn't for several reasons. Um, attacking the Falkland Islands was a massive risk for von Spey. he just had an enormous slugfest with the British at Coronel. Um, he received basically no damage during that battle because his gunnery was so good. Um, but he'd very nearly run out of shells. He'd used an enormous amount of ammunition during the battle, so could not risk another confrontation with the Royal Navy. He had to slip home. So that raises the question, did he get bad intelligence about the Falkland Islands? He was in contact with German intelligence, he thought, via radio, and there's a suggestion um, that uh, British intelligence had actually, by this point, cracked the German ciphers, and did they send him false signals to make him believe that the Falkland Islands was empty. Um, I don't believe it personally for reasons I'll go into in a minute. But it's certainly the case that he took a massive risk attacking the Falklands when he was already almost essentially a spent force, and he did it against the advice of his own captains. 
On the other hand, from the British position, Sturdy nearly didn't make it to the Falklands in time. Um, he was put in command of the battle cruiser squadron. He then wasted loads of time, days and days and days, um, getting his ships absolutely perfect, fixing minor defects. Um, Jackie Fisher, the first Sea Lord, um, when he found out about this, was furious and sent a signal, you know, go now, get on with it. And even as he was heading south, he was not going maximum speed to get to the Germans as soon as possible. Um, he was going at you know economical cruising speed um, to conserve coal. Um, you know, a very conservative sort of sort of view, very leisurely pace. Um, von Spey, on the other hand, was also delayed getting to the Falkland Islands. He stopped to coal his ships for a few days from one of the captured British merchantmen we were talking about earlier. So. There was lots of reasons why they shouldn't have met, um, but they both basically both delayed in the same sort of way, not knowing what the other was doing. So it happens that they both arrived at the Falkland Islands um, within 24 hours. Now, the British arrived at the Falkland Islands, they went into the harbour, and having had a long, hard steam from, from the UK, um, immediately set about maintaining their ships. We were talking about this earlier, um, when the Russian cruiser was out of action, when the Germans turned up, uh, because its boilers were disassembled, they were being cleaned. And this is exactly um, what Dufton Sturdy, who's the handsome gentleman there, uh, standing on the, um, on the deck of his ship, um, did as well. Uh, ordered his ships to clean their boilers, to take on coal, to get ready, to be really fighting fit. Um, and coincidentally, that's why I think the Germans weren't lured onto the Falkland Islands by, by dodgy intelligence fed to them by British cryptographers. I think if that had been the plan, surely somebody would have told Dufton Sturdy the Germans were coming. As it happens, he seemed to have had no idea. And when the Germans arrived um, on the morning um, of the Battle of the Falkland Islands, his ships were disassembled, none of their fires were lit, therefore um, there was no steam up. Any of you who have ever had anything to do with a steam engine of any kind knows it takes a very long time to get a boiler hot enough to um, get the, the water vaporised to, to operate that machinery. Um, and even as the Germans were approaching... Um, they had an opportunity to break and run because they could see a very large amount of smoke rising from Falkland Harbour, of course, that was behind the hills. They weren't approaching towards the mouth, but from the side, coming from the south, of course. And um, von Spey assumed that smoke wasn't coming from ships, but was actually the locals, the Falk Falkland Islanders, burning the coals of stocks of coal so he couldn't have them. Um, so the disposition as the battle began, um, the British were in the harbour with all their ships taken apart, as I said. The Canopus, which is the large pre-Dreadnought battleship, truly a monster, 12-inch guns, you know, just huge, but extremely vulnerable by the time the Great War came round, because it was just of a previous generation. It just so happened to have these enormous ancient guns. So what um, Sturdy had done was order it to beach itself. Um, obviously, you can't sink a ship that's uh, on a beach. Um, so it was essentially turned into a fortress. It was a um, a, a, a stationary a blockhouse, if you like. They then ran a telegraph wire up to the tallest hill outside Stanley, from which they could see the seas all around in all directions, with a guy with a rangefinder and a telephone. So if the Germans did appear, um, he could basically um, be a forward spotter for the enormous guns on the canopus and direct its fire onto the German force. Very clever move, and that's exactly what happened. Um, Von Spey approached the islands, getting closer and closer and closer, and when the time came when he got within range, the spotter gave the order to fire. Um, and because the gunnery platform of the Canopus, because it was on the beach, not on the sea, was so steady and the gunnery was so good, even firing blind over a hill via a, um, a naval gunfire spotter, they hit Von Spey's squadron with the first shell of the first salvo. That's pretty impressive. What let it down was that they'd been doing a training rotation the night before and had forgotten to unload the blank rounds from the guns that morning and clearly in the excitement of spotting a German cruiser forgot they'd left the duds in there. Um, so this shell flew beautifully out of the gun, soared through the air over the ocean and then struck the German cruiser and passed right through it like uh, a pencil through a sheet of paper and basically did no serious damage at all. Um, however, this had the impact of A, alerting the Germans that they were about to face the British um, who were going to put up a fight and B, because it left a perfect round hole um, in the side of the ship it hit, the Germans then knew the exact size of the artillery they were up against. Um, 
knowing, of course, that he had absolutely no chance against long-range 12-inch guns, um, Von Spey uh, turned tail and fled um, in an attempt to save the lives of his own men and still escape to Germany. So let's just go through the the blow-by-blow as quickly as possible because I know I promised we wouldn't have a blow-by-blow. 7.50 in the morning, the ships are disassembled. Um, 7.55, the Germans are spotted. Gunfire begins shortly afterwards at 9.20, strikes the Nisenau with the first hit. Um, It's not until 11 o'clock. This is how um, long it takes for the ships to get out of harbour. Between them being the Germans being spotted at 7.55, the British aren't at sea until 11 o'clock but they have the advantage. The weather is extremely good. So they can see the German squadron and see exactly where they go until actually beyond the horizon, because, of course, the rising smoke still gives away their position. Um, Realising that he's not going to be getting away uh, because the visibility is so good and the British have battle cruisers which are faster than his ships, Um, Von Spey splits his force. He sends the light cruisers away in the hope that they will live because they're his fastest ships and also his two sons uh, who are midshipmen, so they would have been 14 or 15 I suppose, um, were on one of those light cruisers each. So his hope that they would get away and he would keep his heavy cruisers uh, within range of the British um, uh, to fight uh, to the death and in the hope of getting the the smaller ships away Um, the battle ensures um, von spey has played a blinder in that he's sailed out due east rather than going north or south or anything else this is because the wind is blowing east this has the advantage that all the time the british are behind him and they're trying to get his range, they're trying to open fire on him, because the wind is blowing down range from the British, their gunnery is always obscured by their own funnel smoke and their own gun smoke. So every time the British fire their heavy guns at Von Spey at long range, an enormous cloud of cordite um, stops them from A, seeing where the Germans are for a couple of minutes, and also from observing their own fall of shots. They've got no idea whether they're hitting or not. And that's actually a situation that prevails for most of the day, until the British can finally catch up and slide out to the side, so they can then essentially shoot off at 30 degrees, not straight downwind. Um, and it's at that point the heavy cruisers are, are cut to ribbons, in essence. Um, Scharnhorst sinks at quarter past four in the afternoon. Um, Von Spey uh, and everybody on board is killed, no survivors. Um, and the Nisenau, which is the other heavy cruiser, um, is damaged beyond repair. And at six o'clock, she's scuttled um, with very few um, survivors able to be picked up by the British. Um, his plan, unfortunately, to save the, the lives of his own children uh, doesn't work because the British also have um, fast, very fast light ships. They're sent after the light cruisers. Um, the only German survivor from the battle is the Dresden, which is the smallest and fastest ship in the German force, who does get away. By nightfall, um, he still hasn't been shot to pieces, um, so manages to be at large for another three months. Um, but not achieving anything, merely staying alive. And that is the end of the German commerce raiding um, by... There you go. What have I done? That's um, let's have a video. So, yes, yeah, so that's the end of German commerce raiding by piratical means, if you want to call it that, um, for the Great War. Um, and it's U-boats only from here on in. So this is a clip from... Um, I mentioned at the beginning that something that these two battles have in common is that they spawn great films. This is clips from uh, the Battle of the Falkland, Coronel and the Falkland Islands, which is a 1925-6-ish film. Um, it's incredible. It's thoroughly amazing. It's one of the highest grossing British films of all time at this point. The disadvantage it had is it was released right at the end of the silent film era. So while it was intensely popular very briefly after it came out, uh, it had no hope of competing with the talkies um, and was essentially completely forgotten for, for decades. It was restored by the BFI um, a few years ago and is now available on Blu-ray. It's thoroughly incredible, not least because it benefits from the um, Royal Navy's policy of always making its ships available to filmmakers, and that was their policy back then. Uh, So the whole thing is shot, very nearly the whole thing is shot live uh, with real ships firing real salvos with real sailors. There's very little model work, and the sheer volume of ships involved is absolutely mind-boggling it's incredible um so if you fancy it 
give it a go. Um, let me see what else we got here. It's a fantastic photograph actually taken during the battle. Um, this is taken from one of the British battle cruisers of HMS Inflexible. And I just think this gives an absolutely fantastic sense of the, the speed and urgency of it. The, you know, the image obviously is blurred and you can see the smoke up forward as she fires her guns. Um, and, f and if we like uh, ships <laughs> giving out lots of smoke, here's another gratuitous one. This is the um, Shan, uh, the Shan, uh, yeah, the Scharnhorst, uh, which was Von Spee's flagship on which he died. Um, yeah, just a absolutely unnecessarily dramatic picture, really. But there you go. So that was 1914. That was the uh, Battle of the Falkland Islands. How did we get there? Because this is very important for the next part, which I look at my clock and see we do have time to do. Um, it's battle being fought in the South Atlantic because of Britain's importation of food. It's trade. It's the Germans raiding um, grain ships, food ships, coal ships, etc. Um, in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and then trying to dash home uh, via one last hit against the British uh, through, the, through the Atlantic. And that's why the battle happens there. And that's why we're going to see, I think, so many similarities with what comes next. So... <clears throat> Let's fast forward from 1914, the beginning of the Great War, to 1939, uh, the beginning of the Second World War. And this is another battle that happened right at the start of the war, um, that very particular flurry of activity at sea Britain experienced before slipping into the so-called phony war. So just to give you an idea of how intense the naval theatre was right at the beginning of the Second World War. September 3rd, 1939, at 11am, Britain declares war on Germany. Um, and, what, nine hours later, at 7.30 in the afternoon, the SS Athenia is sunk uh, by one torpedo from U-boat U-30. So you have the Athenia there at the top and U-30 at the bottom. Um, this is a terrible loss of life. Um, 117 people killed and the majority of those 70 were actually killed during the rescue attempt that was mounted by several nearby ships um including and i'm sorry for saying this but there is a point um 50 people on a single lifeboat being sucked into the aft propeller of a, of a rescue ship others being crushed to death between uh, their lifeboats and ships attempting to winch them off um it was genuinely truly terrible um, and in fact the sinking of the Athenia was so controversial um, it was covered up by Germany and after, who found it deeply politically embarrassing and after the war it was discovered that even the ship's log of the U-boat 30 um, was modified by the German government so they could you know pretend that they hadn't actually sunk the ship although although they had I, I point this out because for those who are inclined to glorify war um, upon whose number I certainly do not count myself, I find this a very terrible reminder how quickly innocent people are, are drawn into the, the meat grinder of war and those people who were you know, really spectacularly violently killed in, in an attack at sea just within nine hours of Britain declaring war. Um, anyway, so thus with that, the sinking of the Athenia begins the Battle of the Atlantic. It's the first and the longest battle for the British of the Second World War. It basically lasts almost the whole duration of the war um, and, and begins just two days after the invasion of Poland. And this is months and months and months before you know, what people might commonly in this country considered to be the beginning of the war for Britain, which is the Battle of France with the, uh, the BEF and you know, Dunkirk and all that, which is not until May 1940. Um, so this was a, an attack on the British, but it was this was not a battle as such. And the first major battle in the Battle of the Atlantic for the British was 7,000 miles away from Britain in the South Atlantic again, uh, 10 days later on September the 13th. So what have we got here? It's that damn bridge again um, over the keel. Um, and we're looking here at the uh, uh, Captain Hans Langsdorff. Uh, the captain of the Graf Spee. You see, I promised you at the beginning um, von Spee would be in both battles. In the first, he was there physically, and the second, uh, the main German combatant, was named after him. Um, so we're back to the South Atlantic again. Uh, this is the bit where the history begins to echo. In 1939, the UK is still massively dependent on food imports, um, and its ability to execute the war depends on it being connected to its empire. So once again, the German um, early war strategy against the British is commerce raiders. Um, so, right, move on. So let's look at a nice map. We love maps. 
Uh, before the war began, um, Graf Spey um, had slipped out of um, Germany, he'd gone to the South Atlantic, and as the war was declared, he started raiding commerce. And we have, again, this very charming way of putting it, the cruise of the Graf Spey. Um, and we see his track as he comes down from Germany and begins sinking ships. And some of these um, these um, these ships engraved in history's memory, um, the Africa Shell, the um, the Trevanion, etc. Um, and there was very rich pickings for him uh, in the South Atlantic. Again, the same reasons as 1914. Um, we have on the left there Buenos Aires, Montevideo. Um, these incredibly important ports for the South Atlantic trade of of meat and grain going north to Europe and in, and in most cases to Britain. So around that area was the densest um, pickings, as it were, um, for the for the for the German commerce raiders. So the British understanding what was going on, ships being lost. This time, of course, shipborne radio being much more common. They know what's going on, and they pull out all the stops to um, stop um, the Graf Spey and Hans Langdorf as soon as possible. Um, and they get a big um, break early on when the Doric Star, one of those uh, ships we were talking about, manages to get off its position and the fact it's being attacked by the Graf Spey before the ship goes down. So here we have um, HMS Exeter and uh, Commodore Henry Harwood in the top left-hand corner. Um, Harwood, who was in charge of G-Force, which was the British um, rapidly mobile fleet in the South Atlantic, tasked with finding um, the Graf Bay, he came to that conclusion that if he wanted to get this ship, um, it would have to be off the, the river plate where the grain ships and the refrigerated meat ships were. So he, uh, I'm gonna bring that map back, and he sailed in, and you can see the track of Exeter, Ajax, and Achilles um, heading into the river plate where he met the Graf Spey. Uh, and it's uh, you know, a perfectly famous battle, and I think I've got a video clip here. Um, Harwood splitting his um, force in two um, so he could uh, draw the fire of the Von Spey because his two light cruisers, um, the Ajax and the Achilles, if they'd been in company with Exeter, probably wouldn't have stood much of a chance. Their range much lower, their armour much thinner, and they would have been very easy pickings um, for the, the Grasch Bay. Uh, but actually, because he's able to split that fire, because he's able to bring the Exeter forwards, um, Harwood is able to inflict some damage, but not a great deal, um, on um, on the Grasch Bay. And this scene we're looking at here is from the famous film, The Battle of the River Plate, Again, a, um, a great film made from a great battle um, where the Exeter is getting absolutely hammered um, by the Graf Spey. Now, the Exeter took it much harder than the Graf Spey did, and I've got some photographs in a minute to demonstrate that. Um, but that didn't really matter as much. The British had the Empire. They had the numbers, the sheer number of ships that were out looking for Von Spey all over the place, the Graf Spey rather, was huge. The Graf Spey was on its own, it had nowhere to go, and if it took even light damage, it had no hope of running the gauntlet of the British blockade of Northern Europe to get back to Germany. So it was imperative that she won the battle and won it in one piece. So when we see Exeter here having the living daylight slugged out of it by um, by the the, the Graf Bay, it's not so important for the British. They could afford a, a tactical defeat as long as it was a strategic victory. Now, as it happens, sunset comes um, and the the, the Graf Bay heads into the River Plate into Montevideo Harbour, where it declares itself a combatant and under the laws of war, um, the government there is forced to allow it to shelter now for those of you who've seen this film who i imagine is quite quite a lot of you you know the the store and the in the story and the intrigue um with the the british at first keen for the for the grass bay not to come out of montevideo harbor because they couldn't guarantee being able to defeat it in a in a straight fight and then as time progressed as more british um, reinforcements appeared then being keen for it to come out because if it were interned by the the uruguayan government it could subsequently um, fall into the hands of the germans if uruguay entered war on the german side later unlikely but <clears throat> but there you have it but as it happens neither happened um hans langsdorff the captain of the the um the the, the graf spey 
decided he couldn't risk a, a battle against superior British force uh, because he held the lives of his crew highly, although that is not a view that Berlin would have shared. The Berlin's view was that he should go out guns blazing in a, in a, in a fireball of glory. And he also, um, Hans Langsdorff, couldn't allow his ship uh, to go into Uruguayan hands and yeah, essentially being handed over because he would have outstayed his welcome in, in Montevideo because he believed the um, Uruguayans would have handed it over to the British. So to defy both uh, possibilities, he sailed it out uh, into open water, having rigged it, and it exploded in a spectacular ball of fire. And I have a photograph of it um, post that. Um, and it re remained a, um, a hazard to navigation for a very long time afterwards, although parts that have now been um, recovered. So here we go. This is the remains of the Exeter um, after the battle. You can see the, um, the A gun casing there the drooping gun clearly showing that its hydraulics have been shot away and there's a, a a quote in the top right hand corner there of a report from the battle from commodore harwood although it says rear admiral harwood because he was promoted immediately afterwards um the the sheer level of damage the exeter took is extraordinary um and it sort of gives you an idea of how appalling um warfare is uh, which is an important point that we should, we should never forget. So here is the uh, Graf Bay after she was scuttled. Um, Hans Langsdorff, um, having done this, uh, went back to his hotel and shot himself in his full dress uniform. Uh, and the rest, they say, is history. So here we are. That is my last slide. Um, that was my comparison of two um, great and i mean great in the sense of large rather than being good um, naval battles uh, from 1914 and 1939 so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to skip back to the beginning of the presentation so we can ask ourselves some important questions and that is loading ask ourselves does history repeat itself or does it rhyme? And I think it's fair to say, having looked at what we have, that it does rhyme. Um, these were the first major battles of both wars for the British. In the Great War, I'm being a bit cheeky and ignoring Coronel because it's so damn embarrassing. Um, common battleground. Both of these took place in the South Atlantic. And this is the key thing to take away, I think, is to remember how different the British economy was in 1914 and 1939 to how it is now. Um, importing the the great majority of food um, from abroad, it's not like that anymore, despite um, us being, well, as we as we still are, sort of, in a, in a common uh, market with the European Union. We actually grow significantly more of our own food now than we did a century ago, um, which if you think of um, how developed the global economy is now, with globalisation, with free trade, with very easy um, shipping, including flying um, fruit, um, which we always talk about as having air miles these days. But despite these changes, we still imported more a century ago. That's fascinating to me, which is why these battles were fought so far away from home in strategically important areas where the British fleet was spread thinly and the Germans could cause maximum damage. In both cases, um, Germany snatching defeat from the, jo the jaws of victory. In 1914, von Spee didn't have to attack um, the Falkland Islands. It was a choice that he made, and even as he commit before he committed, he had the opportunity to go. Um, but as it happens... <clears throat> He left it too late, and the British were able to commit to the battle as well, and he was destroyed. Um, in '39, um, the Germans under um, Hans Langsdorff on the Graf Spee, um, they had the superior ship. Um, they had thicker armour. They were faster. They had bigger guns, um, but they were still bested by the British, who were acting perhaps more more tactically in battle. Um, Graf Spee present at both. That's self-evident. You understand why that is. Um, in both wars, these battles uh, signalled the end of the commerce raider. Um, as we saw with the plucky Emden, the incredible exploits of that ship, um, the uh, Germans were causing all sorts of havoc in early 1914. But as soon as the that was over, it was over. Same in 1939. It was the Graf Spee out there sinking the merchant ships. And when that was over, it was over. There was no chance of getting back to that. And in both cases, it progressed to the U-boat. And finally, both turn into major motion pictures. So that's all. Um, I believe there's going to be a, uh, a dissection via Zoom. I hope uh, Simon Hartley's going to 